So the word whore appears approximately uh, 85 times if you count the words that include whore, like whoredoms, in the King James Version of the Bible. If you exclude the uh, apocryphal or pseudoepigraphal books, it's about 80 times. And if you include the word harlot, an, about another 50 times. So that's about 130 occurrences in the Old and New Testaments of the King James Bible. I'm not going to go into the Greek today. I'm not going to get very in-depth. I'm not going to try to touch on any of these scriptures comprehensively, but I just want to, as a metaphor, as a metaphor, try to apply the metaphor to the present day. Today is uh, January 27th, the year 2022. Who today is the whore? of Babylon. Now I understand, and this is not again a compre comprehensive exegesis, I understand that the first rule of hermeneutics is, is to interpret the scripture in its immediate historic context, and uh, I'm in line with that, I submit to that, I fully understand that uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and the Jews in the first century are the primary uh, interpretation of the whore. The whore that rides the beast of Revelation 17 is the Jewish people having rejected who should have been their husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm in total agreement that that is the immediate historical representation. Nonetheless, we have over and over and over through the scriptures the metaphors that have an immediate historical application being then, especially the whore metaphor, being then used, recycled, and reused, as the apostles say, as in samples for us, for those in the past, and also for us. And none, I would argue, is more prevalent throughout Old and New Testament than the theme of adultery and whoredoms. And I'm not even counting, you know, Jesus... Uh, uh, I'm not even counting Jesus' words, the word adultery, a wicked and adulterous generation, he called that generation. A wicked and adulterous generation, said the Lord Jesus Christ, um, in the same voice as the prophets, the prophet Nahum, uh, Moses himself. Um, they all spoke of adultery, of whoredoms, of harlotries, the vast majority of those references being negative as a metaphor for God's relationship with his people. Even before God became man, God over and over and over portrayed himself as a husband and a lover who was cuckolded, who was being treated in a despicable manner, who was lied to, who was a victim of what Solomon says, the whore, which is a very deep pit. That's what Solomon says. The wisest man who ever lived until the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he said in the book of Proverbs, a whore is a very deep pit. Now, listen to the words of Moses from Leviticus. By the way, Leviticus, you have to think about who is being addressed in Leviticus. People brush off Leviticus as though there's nothing for uh, the modern believer in Leviticus. But sometimes Leviticus is talking to everyone, Jew and Gentile, the whole world. Leviticus is not only just speaking to the Levites. Leviticus is the word of God, and some of it is dressed, uh, addressed directly to the entire human race and is speaking with reference to God's understanding of basic human morality. The parts about sodomy, the parts about whoredoms. And you can tell, it's not a magic trick to, to look carefully at the context and identify who the particular verse is being applied to and in what context and for what duration it's being given. It's only that people are idiotically and willfully uh, stubborn and lazy about the scriptures. Even people who are very uh, much not uh, lazy, very uh, attentive in other matters of their life, are lazy 
willfully ignorant about the scriptures. But I digress. Leviticus 19, verse 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. And you have an ongoing theme from Moses all the way to Jesus that what the people do in their lives, in their decision about how to treat the word of God and in their bodies sexually affects the land. Literally, the way they behave with their bodies in the act of reproduction affects the land. And, you know, one might ask from an outside perspective, why, for what reason is God so worried, so interested, so concerned about human reproductive behavior, about human sexuality? I contend that from a Christian perspective, if you believe in the Incarnation, you will understand and you must realize that God made a deliberate decision to pass through the womb of a woman, the Holy Virgin Mary. God, the second Adam, in the person of Jesus Christ, could have become a man the way that Adam was created from the dust of the earth, but God deliberately chose to pass through the plumbing, the body, the womb of a woman, to fertilize without the help of any human man, by a miracle of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, the Spirit of truth, her egg was fertilized. That's the Incarnation, the shocking doctrine of the Incarnation that no man can truly believe unless the Holy Spirit gives him the grace to believe it and creates that belief in his heart because it's so radical, it's so outrageous, it's so shocking the idea that God, God Almighty, the creator of heaven, the heavens and the earth would enter into and become incarnate in the womb of a woman. It's shocking. I suggest to you that because, as St. Paul says in Ephesians, this is a great mystery, but the sexual union, the coming together the one flesh union between husband and wife is a metaphor of Christ and his bride, the church. Because of that, and because God passed through the reproductive system of a virgin, a woman, deliberately did so. Now, not only God, but Satan and the whole hosts of heaven, the fallen from heaven, from their first estate, the wicked ones, but also the exalted ones, the holy angels, all are extremely concerned about human sexual behavior because, and misbehavior, because God didn't become a frog, God didn't become a building, God didn't become a city, God didn't become a state, okay, God didn't become the will of the proletariat, <laughs> you Marxists. God didn't become democracy, God didn't become a planet, God became a man, a human being. And he passed, it bears repeating, he passed through the womb of a woman. Therefore, anyone who bears the image of that which God became, namely a human man, and any woman that bears the image of the church and of Mary, she through whom God became incarnate, through whose body, through whose blood, through whose egg, by the miracle and power of God. When we bear that image, we are not going to get away with wanton desecration of our bodies and sexuality. If we don't repent, <laughs> if we don't repent, we are going to face a terrible judgment. A terrible judgment. The desecration of sexuality is an eternal metaphor for the unfaithfulness from Genesis to Revelation, the unfaithfulness of any people that claims to be the covenant people of God, that makes a claim on his covenant, and yet, and yet, turns around in the eyes of 
the unbelievers, all who do not make such a claim, all who do not know God or presume or claim to know God, and desecrates human sexuality, commits murders, commits adulteries, practices lying and doesn't repent, practices harlotry wantonly, makes his daughter into a whore, gives her to a man and then turns around and gives her to another man, like the uh, father-in-law of Samson, or like King Saul did to David. Very wicked. This common practice and all the prostitutions and unfaithfulness that is common among Western civilization today, and you see now I'm bringing it back home. Yes, I understand the historical context. It's real, but it is there as an example for us. An example set forth for us, for this generation, right now, 27th January, 2022, so that we would take heed and not repeat those mistakes. And yet we are in the middle of the greatest repetition of the, those mistakes in Christian history bar none, with all the adulteries and all the infidelities and all the problems and backslidings of former generations over the past 2,000 years. Nonetheless, there was always the grain within Western civilization from the time of Constantine up till just a few decades ago <laughs> and the sexual revolutions that overswept Russia, first France and then Russia, all of Europe and then America the normalization of contraceptives by the Anglican Church through a, 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 a degree of backsliding, degrees of backsliding and capitulations, here we are. 2022, people are receiving seed into their bodies simply because a medical establishment that is itself a whore, unfaithful to their husband Hippocrates and to his vow and oath, are you understanding me? The medical establishment was a sacred marriage, a priesthood. A priesthood where men and women who served in that priesthood from 300 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, the time of Hippocrates, when he drew a circle around his disciples and said, whatever else anyone else does, they may do good, they may do evil, they may heal, they may kill. My disciples, said hypocrisy, Hippocrates, through his oath, my disciples do not harm people. My disciples will not give a pessary to a woman to cause an abortion or a miscarriage. That's what he said. And he swore by the gods he knew, by Apollo and Artemis, we won't do it. And you know what? God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came 300 years later through the Virgin Mary, honored that tradition, calling himself the great physician. Our God is the great physician. Well, now... The generation that is receiving these medical, uh, pseudo-medical, actually witchcraft, actually sorcery, experimental jabs that are not medical in the Hippocratic sense. So fake medical um, injections are receiving the seed of an institution that is in, in and of itself exo-Hippocratic, having left the tradition, the 2,300-year-old, the are you hearing me? Medical tradition of Hippocrates has been abandoned. Now, people professing Christ, people professing to be Christians, are receiving that right and left. They need to repent. This is a great whoredom, a great falling away, a great apostasy. And what happened to the Jerusalem uh, Jews in their repudiation of the Lord when they crucified him said we have no king but Caesar. Those who did not repent and become Christians in the book of Acts at the preaching of Peter died a horrible death in AD 70 in the terrible siege. Read about it in Josephus the Jewish war miserable suffering like no other before or since that went on year after year until they were eating their own children. Now, some escaped decades before through the blood of Jesus Christ because they believed Peter, some of those Jews who crucified Jesus, believed 
the Apostle Peter and repented and became Christians. Now, the Christians, fast forward 2,000 years, are themselves giving their daughters to be whores, joking with the sexuality of their own daughters, not teaching their children to repent, not preaching uh, the word of God and leading them correctly, giving their daughter to one man and then turning around giving her to another man, joining in the sexual revolution, winking at it, and acting as Psalms 50 warns very strongly against, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee. I will reprove thee, saith the Lord, and set these things in order before your eyes. You need to hear it from me. My name is Jonathan O'Toole. I'm a lay preacher. I'm not a priest. I'm not ordained. But hear it from me and hear it from the word of God. You don't, when, when prostitutes and people of, on the street of a wicked spirit hear the preaching of God, a lot of times they say, only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. Well, sister, brother, friend, you don't want that. You do not want God to judge you. You want a mediator. You want a preacher. You want someone in between you and God so that you're ready to meet God. And the only way to be ready to meet God is through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, through repentance, through confession of sin. That is not a confession, a technical confession, so that you can go on repeating it deliberately. Not that we don't repeat sins as Christians, but the premeditation is blasphemous. You cannot repent and premeditate at the same time your sin. Like I've seen women do, I'm going into the abortion clinic, sweetheart, and I'm going to kill uh, this baby, have this abortion, and Jesus has already forgiven me before I've done it. Well, woman, it doesn't work that way. Man, it doesn't work that way. You're going to think again. You do not want only God can judge me. You do not want to stand before God naked and have him judge me. You want to hear me. You want to hear the word of God. You want to hear the Bible instead and repent before that day. Now, today is the day. Who is the whore of Babylon? Today, 2022, in a very real sense, a metaphorical but nonetheless very real sense, the whore of Babylon, that whore that rides the beast. What's the beast? Secular government. Secular government in opposition to the law of God and of his Christ. Read Psalms 2. And the whore is the professing believer who professes to believe the Bible, who professes to believe in Jesus Christ, who professes his atonement, and yet receives the seed of this world. And I, the jab is one thing. The injection, the mRNA injection, don't receive it, okay? But even that is in and of itself a metaphor for what's going on in the heart. When men and women are being sexually lascivious, they're giving their daughters to fornication, they're turning their daughters into whores, they're winking at the sexual revolution, they're winking at immorality, which God never does. They're not confessing it, they're not fighting to defend the law of God, they're fighting to defend their own conceits, and their own pride. And they're siding with the secular uh, military industrial complex and state that is murdering people, including Christians, including Muslims, good people around the world. People who need to hear the gospel in many cases. Instead are receiving from America, from Europe, from London, the United Kingdom, from Tel Aviv, and those who support the fake state of Israel, a fake Israel, false satanic Israel, and their racist antichrist agenda. What people who need to hear the gospel are hearing from these westernized Christians of Western civilization is a lie, adultery, prostitution, murder, pride, and conceit being forced down their throats. The destruction that befell Jerusalem, unbelieving Jerusalem, is poised and ready as an example to fall upon 
adulterous Western civilization who is no longer, by any stretch of the imagination, making any good faith attempt to enforce the law of God and of his Christ, but has wiped her mouth of her history and of her covenant with the Lord, which was never perfect, but God doesn't require perfection. He requires confession, repentance, and a good faith attempt of the governments and an individual's confession, repentance, and faith. But of governments, God requires a good faith, good faith attempt. Can't ever be perfect until kingdom come, but a good faith attempt to enforce the law of God and of his Christ. That good faith attempt to the extent that it did exist at one time in the various representatives throughout Europe and her colonies of Western civilization, that good faith attempt, warts and all, is now dead and gone. It does not exist. Maybe, maybe a glimmer in Russia and Poland, but those two are so set against one another, and Russia still has legalized abortion. For all intents and purposes, in the West, of course we don't include Russia in the West, in the West, the good faith attempt to serve the living God, to enforce his law, is dead. The Western world, former Western civilization, you can't even call it civilization, it's organized barbarism now, is the whore that rides the beast and is drunk on adulteries and drunk on the blood of God's people. And he's going to destroy her.